Hey everyone, we're going to do a video today on water potential, and this video is going to be a little bit different because I actually have slides set up. So I'm recording on an iPad, and the way it records is a little bit choppy, so forgive that. Forgive me that my flow isn't is going to be as good as it normally is, but the slides are important because I've got some good visuals for you. And so water potential is based on osmosis, so we're going to be describing this thing called water potential. This is visualized, symbolized by the Greek letter psi. So you can see this little trident looking thing. Um, I think the official, I've never taken Greek, but I think it has little loops there. All the times you'll just see is kind of that trident looking guy. Um, but this describes how water is going to move into or out of a system based on a few factors. So let's do some quick review to start with. So this is a diagram of the cell wall or cell membrane, excuse me, you've seen this before. Remember the red particles in this are the phospholipids. The phospholipid has two components. It has a negatively charged head made of a phosphate molecule or phosphate um, ion and then it has neutral or uncharged tails. These are fatty acids attached to a glycerol molecule here in the head. The phospholipids are amphiphilic meaning the heads are hydrophilic. They like to be, they will orient themselves to the aqueous solution. They're polar. These tails are hydrophobic. They will orient themselves away from the aqueous environment and that's why we have a bilayer here on our membrane. Also integral to, or also important in the cell membrane are these proteins. So there are multiple kinds of proteins that line the cell membrane. So this would be a peripheral protein. There's a surface level protein here. And then we have these integrated proteins. These are integrins. Some of them may be aquaporins, which allow water to travel right through. They facilitate diffusion. On the outside of the membrane, there are these gly uh, uh, sugars, the carbohydrates. So we can have glycolipids. These are attached to the lipids themselves, or we can have a glycoprotein. These are mainly used for cell identification and cell signaling. Also as a point of review, we've got tonicity, and tonicity describes the, uh, the solution that a cell is placed in. And this is important that we identify the reference point. So when all of tonicity, our reference point is the cell, right, is the reference. So in a hypotonic solution, remember we are looking at the concentration of dissolved materials, or the concentration of water, essentially. And that's a little bit misleading because water is a pure liquid, it doesn't have a concentration. So this maybe is the amount of water, is a better way to say it. In a hypotonic solution, we have a high amount of water on the outside, meaning that we have a low amount of water on the inside. Because osmosis goes from a high concentration to a low concentration, water is going to diffuse through the cell membrane, and into the cell. In a plant cell, it will actually burst like a balloon. In a plant cell, or excuse me, in an animal cell, it will burst like a balloon. In a plant cell, we get what's called turgid. Um, and turgid means there's pressure on the cell wall. It's, it's bulging just a little bit. Isotonic means that the concentration or the amount of water inside is equal to the amount of water outside, or the quantity of water outside is equal to the quantity of water inside. Water's moving in, it's moving out at the same rate. There's no net movement, and that's important for isotonic. No net movement. Hypertonic is the opposite of hypotonic, so we have low water on the outside and high water on the inside. We diffuse via osmosis from the inside across the membrane to the outside and that cell will actually shrivel up. In a plant cell we call that plasma plasmolysis. So applying that principle, if I know what the concentration is, we can predict which direction water will travel via osmosis. So we've got five beakers here and we're going to make a prediction and we're going to look at the change or delta mass. So if I know the concentrations, I can predict what's going to happen to the mass of this. This is what I'm assuming is dialysis tubing, but some kind of membrane. So in this first system, actually, let's look at this middle system first. So I have a 0.2 molar solution on the inside and a 0.2 molar solution on the outside. There are equal amounts, equal quantities of water. And so we have an equal net movement into and out of that bag. So blue is really hard to see. Let's change it to red. And maybe I'm making the pen just a little bit bigger. We have equal movement into the cell, into that bag, and out of that bag. This would be an isotonic solution. You would expect zero change, no change in mass in that bag. There might be some negligible change there, but for the most part, the mass is going to stay the same. There's no appreciable quantity. 
we look at this particular system next, we have a high or a low concentration of material inside, meaning we have a lot of water, and a high concentration of material on the outside, meaning lower water. So we move from high to low, so we, this bag is going to be losing water to the surrounding solution. It would be hypertonic, and so this one would have a lower delta mass. If we compare that to, let's say, um, this bag, number four, it's just the opposite. We have a high concentration of stuff inside and a low concentration of stuff outside. So this one would have low water and the outside would have high water, so our direction is reversed. Water is going to enter the bag, and so this one would be increase delta mass. Right, we'd have an increase in the mass of that bag because water is flowing in. So this is a very simple... Um, you know, low-level qualitative prediction of what's going to happen. We can use this to describe the system in general, but water potential takes us to the next step. It's important to recognize that we are modeling with water potential. This is not the exact thing. This is based on evidence. It's based on observations, but we are giving a mathematical model of what is happening and why it's happening. So it tries to describe what's happening. So let's take a look at this model. We've got another diagram showing tonicity, but this time we've got cells and we're using distilled water. Okay, and this is important. So distilled water, this is pure. There are no solutes. Okay, it is straight H2O. So that is as high of a quote unquote concentration. Remember water, liquid water does not have a concentration, but this is straight water. That means that in any cell, no matter what cell it is, plant, animal, whatever, there's stuff dissolved inside of our cells, so water is going to net across the board, move into that cell. Remember, if you have an animal, it's just a cell membrane, and you typically lice, it breaks. In a plant cell, though, we have this cell wall, and that cell wall provides a little bit of structure. So when we take a plant cell and place it into a distilled water aqueous environment, there is net movement of water into that plant cell. And then we get this buildup of pressure. Check this out. This is really interesting. When we're looking at water potential, you're not going to equal out your concentrations just because the quantities of water inside of the cells are very, very small. And so when we reach equilibrium, it's not necessarily a concentration equilibrium. What we call it is a water potential equilibrium. We have canceled out the movement of water. We have resisted that further movement of water because of other factors. So in a plant cell, the pressure inside of the cell pushing back out is equal to the pressure of the water trying to diffuse into the cell. And that's where we reach our dynamic equilibrium. And this is how we're going to describe water potential. So here's our simple model for water potential. From a plant's point of view, we're only focusing on two things at this point. We're going to be looking at the pressure potential and at the solute potential. There are other variables involved with plants, especially when you're looking at a macro scale. So if you're looking at a tree, there's also gravity. That's a major, major influence to the water potential of a plant, and that's important when that plant is trying to draw water through its root system up to its leaves. Uh, so we've talked about transpiration. This is manipulating water potential as well. But for today, we're talking at the cellular level. All we're going to look at is the pressure and the solute potential. Uh, pressure is pretty easy. So pressure comes from the rigid cell wall that limits further water uptake. So our system, remember, is our cell. And so the pressure potential increases as the cell takes on water. That pressure inside the cell on the cell wall is increasing. So this increases... as the cell takes on water. Pressure starts at zero. At atmospheric pressure that's in an open container, there is zero pressure. As water starts to, fall, to flow into that cell, um, it's taking on water. There's a higher pressure on the, on the plant cell wall, and so that pressure potential is increasing. We'll look at what that means on the next slide. I'm going to clear this out just so we have a clean slide to work with. Um, if you need to go back, you can just rewind and pause it. But essentially, pressure increases as the cell takes on water. Solute potential is always negative. Always negative. It is reducing the potential for that water to move. 
So here's why it's negative. If I'm a water molecule, so here's some Mickey Mouse ear water molecules, right? There's a certain amount of hydrogen bonding between us. So this would be like a hydrogen bond. It's an attraction. It's a positive negative attraction, right? We have positive hydrogens, negative oxygens. There's a there's just a magnetic attraction. But essentially there is nothing keeping me from doing what I want to as a water molecule. Um, the other way to think about it is there is uh, the highest level of entropy, the highest level of disorder that we could have in a particular system when there is nothing else dissolved. So this would be like distilled pure water. As soon as we start to add some solutes, so maybe these are salt ions, they could be sugar molecules. As soon as we add solutes, these guys are also going to start to form hydrogen bonds or use those attractions. This is going to limit the ability of water to move. The other way you can think about it is that this is now decreasing entropy, right? Lower entropy equals lower energy. Free energy gives free energy. So that we're looping back to this idea from last semester. So lower entropy means lower energy means a lower potential. That's why solute potential is always negative in nature. It is going to limit the, the ability of water to move from one place to the other. And this is a very, very important concept. So you really have to make sure you understand it. So let's take a look at the definition. This is the effect of a solute, right? The dissolved material, pure water has a solute potential of zero meaning that it is not, it's going to move as much as it can. As solute is added, those water molecules move less, they are less able to move around, so the water potential becomes more negative. The water potential decreases. That water is less likely to move just because of the inhibition of other stuff. In total, the, as solute is added, water potential of the solution drops. This is hugely important. Please make sure you understand this. Let's take a look at an example. Remember, we've reached equilibrium when there is no net movement. So we've already talked about the factors that can impact water potential. Distilled water in an open container has zero pressure potential and zero solute potential, giving me a system that has zero water potential. There's not going to be any movement. There's a plant cell immediately put into distilled water. There is solutes inside my plant cell. There's stuff, sugar, salts, different things dissolved. That's why the solute potential is negative, too. Water potential moves from a high potential to a low potential, so the distilled water of zero is going to force water into that plant cell by osmosis until, notice the pressure, look at this. As water moves in, this pressure is increasing. We have a positive value here. Solute potential is still the same. Concentration hasn't changed, but we've now reached an equilibrium. The water potential is back to zero because the internal solute pressure is equal to the internal pressure potential on that cell wall. And this is water potential. We can use this to model reaching equilibrium. So the final question we need to answer is, well, if I need to know solute potential, how do we calculate solute potential? You can use this equation. This is on your AP Bio formula sheet, but let's just talk about how to interpret it. Um, solute concentration, for, or excuse me, solute potential is more than just concentration, right? So concentration has to do with it, but we have to actually calculate this psi s, the potential due to the solute. So i, little i, is the number of particles that, uh, that the molecule will create when it's dissolved. Remember, sodium chloride, this is a salt, it's ionic, so we actually get sodium ions and chlorine ions. I, from this single molecule, this ionic compound, we get two ions. That's why it's two here. For sucrose or glucose, these do not ionize, so the number stays as a one. So pay attention, is it ionic or is it a covalent compound? If it's ionic, we have a metal, right? Sodium is a metal on your periodic table on the left, and chlorine is a non-metal. Those will form ions. Anything else is uh, covalent. It does not ionize. C is the molar concentration. You, you know how to calculus. Remember that molarity is equal to moles of solute per liter of solution. So you can calculate the C if it's not given to you. R is a pressure constant. This is also on your uh, formula sheet, so you don't need to memorize it, but it is good to have as much committed to memory as you can. And then T is the temperature in Kelvin, and Kelvin is 273 plus your temperature in degrees Celsius. So as we increase temperature, right, 
those particles move faster, they have more energy, and so the potential for moving also increases. Um, so remember though, there's a negative right there in front of this because solute potential is always negative, right? We are decreasing the likelihood that water is going to move. So do not forget to negate your product. So there's a lot there. This is a big video and I, I do apologize for the length. But some tips, just remember, don't forget that pressure in an open container is zero, okay? Pressure comes from the water pressure entering the cell and pushing on that cell wall. Solutes always lower the water potential. Tip pressure typically raises the water potential in an open system. Uh, solute potential has to be calculated, and we just looked at the equation for that. Um, this is uh, psi is negative I C R T. And then ionization constant matters, so do not forget about I right there. This is very, very important. So pay close attention to what kind of substance you have dissolved in your water. Thanks for watching. If you have questions, please feel to leave, uh, feel free to leave a comment below. Uh, or if you're in my class, you can shoot me an email or send me something on Canvas. Everybody else, thank you again for watching.